Hey everybody, welcome back. My name is Annie Elise and this is 10 to Life. Okay guys, the case that we're talking about today is one that I found very, very fascinating and interesting, but honestly, there are so many twists and turns that even while I was collecting my research, I, my head was kind of spinning. I was like, okay, am I going down this path? Am I going down this path? Is this real credible information? I mean, there are just so many twists that it was really hard to keep my head straight during this and it just has me completely stumped and quite honestly kind of shocked i don't know if this was a crime of passion i don't know if this was a sexual fetish i don't know if this was a hired hit or the drug cartel somehow retaliating i mean there are just so many twists and turns in this case guys so buckle up because we are going to get into it right now Sent to Life with Annie Elise starts right now. All right, guys, so my name is Annie Elise, as I mentioned earlier, and this is 10 to Life, where we talk all things true crime. So if you are brand new, stopping by for the first time, welcome. I hope you enjoy today's case video and hearing what I have to say. And if you do, make sure you hit that subscribe button below. And for all of you returning subscribers, welcome back. So happy to have you here. I love seeing all of the familiar names just pop up in the comments and in the chat. So I appreciate you guys coming back and sticking with me through this one. As I mentioned, the case we've got today is a crazy one of the crazier ones that I've covered as far as just because there's it's like a true I hate this expression but it's a true who done it kind of thing and there's just like so many different added layers there's you know the drug cartel there's sexual fetishes there's you know domestic disputes there's just so many different layers in it that I, it's just crazy. So anyways, I'm going to stop talking. Let's get right into the case. Lindsay Buziak was born on November 2nd in 1983. She had one sister and she grew up in a suburb of Canada. In 2008, the 24-year-old ended up starting a real estate career. She was ambitious. She was living in Victoria, Canada at the time, and she really wanted to set forth this journey to be a career woman. And Lindsay had a very promising future ahead of her. Her family and friends describe her as not only smart and hardworking, but also very caring, very ambitious, and just very popular among everybody she met. Everybody seemed to love her. Lindsay also had a boyfriend named Jason, and Jason was a part of a very prominent family. This family had ties to real estate as well. They were very wealthy. They owned a successful real estate business actually themselves, and life was just looking good for Lindsay. She had a promising career. She had this amazing romance that was blooming and flourishing, and he comes from, you know, a great family. What could possibly go wrong? And things were going so good in Lindsay's life, in fact, that in January of 2008, she got a call from a prospective real estate lead, and this lead seemed to be everything that Lindsay had been looking for. This potential deal that was coming through for Lindsay would earn her a very, very high commission. So Lindsay was, of course, very, very excited about it and very eager to see what it was these prospective clients were looking for. The woman who called Lindsay had explained to her that she and her husband were urgently looking to purchase a home. She said they had a budget of $1 million, but that the catch was they needed a home within three days. Now, this is every realtor's dream, right? It's like, it's an easy client, a really large budget. They're looking to buy as soon as possible, so you know that that commission is going to be coming in pretty quickly. Everything sounds great. However, the caller had a foreign accent that Lindsay couldn't quite place. She had described it as either being Spanish or Mexican, but she said, I couldn't quite understand where this accent was from. Also, the fact that she needs this house within three days, ooh, something just isn't feeling right here. This transaction too easy? Was this big commission going to come too easy? Was it too good to be true? After feeling a little bit uneasy with the call, Lindsay ended up asking the client how she got her number. And the client said to her, you know, somebody that you had previously sold a house to referred me, they gave me your contact information, so here I am. And okay, that makes sense. That's typically how business is passed along within real estate. It's definitely referrals. It's people who you've helped in the past. So although she was new to real estate, Lindsay said, okay, all right, I guess, you know, everything's fine. I'm probably just overthinking this. And maybe this wasn't too good to be true. Maybe Lindsay was just really getting a break in her career. 
Lindsay ended up telling her boyfriend Jason and her father about the call, mentioning that she felt a little uneasy and that she had a couple concerns, but otherwise felt really excited and was excited about this opportunity. Lindsay's boyfriend Jason encouraged her to take the client, saying this could be great for your career, it's such a high commission, it's not going to require too much, you shouldn't read too much into this, this looks like it would be great for you, you should absolutely take it. And he even said, you know, if you're feeling uneasy or you're feeling nervous, I'll go with you to the showing and I will wait outside for you, I'll go with you so that you just don't feel uncomfortable. So Lindsay agreed and she decided to take the client and she went to work looking for homes. The woman had given Lindsay a specific specific list of criteria that the home she wanted had to meet and this included it being three bedrooms three bathrooms the master bedroom needed to be large and they also wanted a separate housekeeper quarters within the house for their housekeeper a very particular set of things that somebody was looking for but that is actually very helpful because it really then narrows down the search as far as different homes that you are going to propose to the buyers. Not long into the search, Lindsay ended up finding a suitable home for this couple, and she made an appointment to show this home to them on February 2nd, 2008. The husband was unable to make it that day, but the woman said that she would come and see the property, so they made an appointment for 5.30 p.m. that Saturday. That day, Lindsay and Jason decided that they would go out, have a late lunch. Once they wrapped up lunch, they would go to the property together. She would show the property. That way, he was still nearby because, remember, he had offered to be there in case she felt uncomfortable. So everything was looking great. They go to lunch. They wrap up around 4.30. And before going to the property, Lindsay decides that she's going to go back and change her clothes really quick because she wanted to make sure that she looked nice and looked professional for this showing. Jason and Lindsay ended up leaving the restaurant in two separate cars because, as I mentioned, Lindsay wanted to go home. She wanted to change first. These were million-dollar customers. She wanted to look her best. And Jason actually had to go to a nearby auto shop to meet with a colleague. So they drove separately, and then they were going to meet at the property. So while Lindsay's at home changing, Jason goes to this appointment at this auto shop, and apparently the owners of the auto shop had hired Jason to sell the property. And so he was bringing in an offer, he was meeting up with a colleague, and he was doing a deal at the shop. After picking up his colleague at the shop, Jason had texted Lindsay saying that he was running a little bit behind, but that he and his colleague were coming to the property to meet her. They didn't leave the auto shop until closer to 5.30 p.m., which was the time that the appointment was supposed to begin. So again, he texts Lindsay, says, I'm running a few minutes late, but I will be there, and she acknowledges it. The street on which the property is located is a small cul-de-sac with only four houses, and the property that Lindsay was showing is on the outer edge of the cul-de-sac, and it's on the intersection of a main road right on that corner there. And so you can see that the side of the property and the back fence run parallel to that main road. As Jason is on his way to the property, he's trying to use his GPS system to find the address, but he has no luck. So he ended up calling Lindsay for directions. Well, while on the phone with Lindsay, the couple apparently arrived for this showing, and Lindsay apparently told Jason, okay, I'll see you in a few minutes, I gotta go, the Mexicans are here, and she said that because, again, it was the foreign accent that she had recognized earlier in that call. So Jason says, okay, that's fine, go ahead, meet with them, just text me. So as Lindsay was at this property waiting for this woman to arrive for the showing, she sees this couple approaching her and approaching the property, despite the woman having earlier told her that she would be there alone that her husband couldn't make it. Now it was a couple. Lindsay saw a six foot tall Caucasian man with dark hair and a blonde woman between the ages of 35 and 45 wearing a distinctively bright colored dress. Lindsay shook hands with the couple, greeted them, unlocked the lockbox, and entered into the home. At 5.38 p.m., just a couple of minutes after the showing was set to begin, Jason texted Lindsay and said, I'm just a couple of minutes away. However, Lindsay never answered the text. But at 5.41 p.m., just a couple of minutes later, Lindsay's phone placed a phone call. It was a phone call to a friend of hers that she hasn't talked to in a long time. Unfortunately, the friend did not answer, and the voicemail that was left was very muffled. About 10 minutes later, Jason and his colleague arrived to the property, and as they were driving up to the property, Jason sees a figure through the glass front door and assumed that the showing was already underway and that they were already in the house. So Jason parks outside of the property for about 10 minutes, but then he decides to move his car and park back on that main road because he says he didn't want to seem like a nosy boyfriend who was trying to interfere and trying to, you know, just kind of hover over his girlfriend. He wanted to allow her space to do this on her own. So after waiting another 10 minutes parked on that main 
road, Jason texted Lindsay again, and he wanted to check in to see if everything was okay. However, Lindsay did not respond, so he called her, and she did not answer. With neither the text or the phone call answered, Jason and his colleague decided to walk up to the house and see what was going on. They approached the house, the front door was locked. Now, this is a very big no-no in real estate, especially when showing houses. The front door is usually always open and always unlocked for clients and realtors to gain access, and just as a safety measure. So the men started ringing the doorbell, but there was absolutely no answer. Through the fuzzy glass on the front door, Jason was able to see Lindsay's shoes in the foyer of the house, which this is standard because you usually take your shoes off to walk the house. So he sees her shoes, but he doesn't see any movement in the house. So Jason begins knocking on the door repeatedly and there is no answer. At this point, he knew something wasn't right. And so he called 911 at just 6.05 PM. And he told the dispatcher that his girlfriend, Lindsay, was meeting an out of town client, showing them houses, and that Lindsay was kind of scared kind of nervous and so he went along to just kind of follow her and make sure that everything was okay and now nobody is answering the door. Well while Jason was on the phone with the 911 operator, Jason's colleague had found a gap in the fence in that backyard garden area. So he entered through that gap in the back garden and noticed that the back patio door was wide open. He called out to Jason who then told the operator that they had found a way in, that he was going into the house to check, and then he hung up the phone. Jason's colleague went in through that back patio door came through the main level of the home and then opened the front door to allow Jason access into the home. Upon entering, they decided to divide and conquer, so the colleague was looking all through the downstairs of the house and Jason immediately ran upstairs. When he got upstairs, he entered the master bedroom and discovered that Lindsay was lying in a pool of blood. Jason yelled for his colleague to call 911 again and began performing CPR on Lindsay. His colleague told 911 that they had seen bloody footprints in the house and that they had discovered Lindsay's body in a pool of blood. When law enforcement arrived, Jason and his colleague were in the window of the master bedroom waving their arms trying to get them up there. Police began to process the scene and Lindsay was pronounced dead when the paramedics arrived. Lindsay's cause of death was severe blood loss and she had been stabbed over 40 times in the head and in the chest. There was no sign of SA, and based on her phone activity, the investigators believe that she was killed within a three minute window. There were also no defensive wounds on Lindsay, indicating that she had probably initially been stabbed in the back from behind and had no inkling that this attack was going to be happening. Police searched the house for the murder weapon, but it wasn't there. And law enforcement gathered hair and fiber evidence, and they looked for DNA at the scene and for fingerprints, trying to analyze everything to figure out who could have been responsible for this. Lindsay's wallet, phone, and purse were also left behind, indicating that this wasn't a robbery. This was a targeted and planned attack. Jason and his colleague were, of course, immediately taken into custody for questioning, as many people on the scene often are, but they were ultimately released without charge because their version of events were verified and there were timestamps of surveillance footage from the auto shop, from the restaurant, and it proved that they could not have committed this crime. And in an interesting turn, the family of Lindsay's boyfriend, Jason, was also investigated because apparently they had connections to this particular cul-de-sac and the properties in it. The developer was a friend and a business associate of Jason's mother, Shirley, and apparently Part of that cul-de-sac was still under construction at the time of the murder, and the developer himself was at that location just an hour before the murder, supervising construction work that was going on. However, after investigating the family, the police had said that nobody in the family was a suspect. And police believe that the killers were leaving through the front door when Jason first drove up to the property, and then they fled through the back door, leaving that patio door wide open. Due to complete lack of DNA, fingerprints, or, or any other physical evidence at the scene, it's believed that the murder was very, very well organized and carried out by people who had perhaps killed before. So was this a thrill kill? Was it a couple who gets their kicks off of, you know, blitz attacking young women in homes or realtors? Have they done this before? Is this something, again, that they just kind of, you know, bond over? There was no explanation. But this murder and who was responsible was about to get much, much more complicated. 
the cell phone that was used by that unknown woman to call Lindsay and first request this showing was purchased in Vancouver several months before the murder took place. And what's interesting though, is it was purchased several months before, but it had never been used. Lindsay is the only person that was ever called from that phone. It was activated under the name Paolo Rodriguez, which authorities also believe was a fake name. The phone was registered to a legitimate business in Vancouver, but upon investigation, they realized that that business had absolutely no ties to Lindsay, to the showings, or to anything else. Soon after the murder, that burner phone was also deactivated, and it has not been used since. Authorities believe that that cell phone was used for the sole purpose of the murder and then was discarded afterwards. And this goes back to support the police's theory that this was very planned and very premeditated and done by, most likely, by professionals. As this investigation is underway, Jason, Lindsay's boyfriend, does a reenactment, and he shows what happened when he entered that property, where he went to look for Lindsay, and what transpired that day. Which side of the door was going on when, when the door opened for you? Right where the door So, yeah, so I'll do that. I'm just, yeah. sorry, I don't worry about it. So, he opens it like this, does he open it all the way, or you just... He, un he unlocked the door. Okay, he unlocks it, yeah. So, I unlock it. Okay, it's unlocked. I just opened it. Okay, so. So I don't know if his hand. He, I know that because I heard it unlock. Okay. The second he unlocked it, I, I pushed it open. Okay. Uh, yeah. um, he was already in front of me. Yeah. And I said, I'm running upstairs. Okay. And so I was yelling. I was, was yelling. I'm like, Lindsay, Lindsay, Lindsay. And where did Cohen go? He went straight ahead. He went straight ahead. Yeah. Okay. Um, so just hang on a sec there. Uh, yeah. So he went straight ahead. Yeah. And you you went running upstairs? Yeah. Okay, so let me okay, so let me go upstairs first, and then you can talk your your way go up the stairs, and then, and then we'll go to the end, right? Mm -hmm. You okay? Yep. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> okay. So I was running inside the house. Uh, I just came running up the stairs. Do you remember grabbing the banister at all, or? Uh, down there. Okay. Did you, what else were you doing? Did you, did you see anything? Did you hear anything? Did you smell anything? Kind of put yourself back there into, into that value uh, back home. The, uh, the, the time I got to from the door to upstairs was probably two seconds. Okay, so you're... Like, I was running up the stairs. Okay. Yeah. Like, I didn't walk. I didn't... The second I opened the door, I yelled, Lindsay, Lindsay, uh, and then I ran, I ran up these stairs as fast as I could. Okay. So I ran. Up. Now, although there were no solid leads tying back to DNA or forensic evidence, luckily there was a witness on the street that day who saw Lindsay arrive at the property and who saw Lindsay greet the couple. This witness provided a description to the police and they then composited a sketch. The woman was white, reportedly between 35 and 45 years old. She had short blonde hair and was very well dressed. The dress or skirt was black with thick white and red swirls throughout it and a very bold color. Very little information was given about the male, however, except that he was white, approximately six feet tall, had dark hair, and was wearing a light colored jacket. During the investigation, according to documents, law enforcement had noticed that something was off about Lindsay's online behavior shortly before her murder. They could tell that chat messages were missing, but they couldn't find out when they were deleted and they couldn't recover the messages to figure out what the content actually was. They also say that her behavior on Facebook was different, and although she had 700 friends on Facebook, she hadn't exchanged messages with anybody since January 24th. That year after the murder, Lindsay's close friend Nikki says that she was awakened in the middle of the night by a phone call one night by a woman with a mysterious foreign accent. She says that she was half asleep and didn't quite register what the female caller was saying, but that she noticed that she did have a very strange accent that she couldn't place. And she immediately became scared because she remembered that Lindsay had previously complained and expressed concern about a client who had a weird accent and possibly that person could have been her murderer. So now, fully alert and awake, Nikki calls that number back, but nobody picks up. So she calls back between 20 and 30 times until somebody answered. 
And sure enough, when somebody did answer, the woman on the other end of the line was Shirley, Jason's mother. Nikki asked Shirley why she called her and how she even had her number because they didn't know each other. Shirley replied and said that she had meant to call another Nikki, her secretary particularly, and that she didn't know why this Nikki's number was in her phone, and that her son Jason must have added it into her contact list. Which now that seems just very bizarre because nobody is just casually adding phone numbers to people's phones for contacts that they don't know. So how did this girl, how did Nikki's phone number get in Shirley's phone? And Shirley has denied that this event ever occurred. And while it's unclear if authorities ever actually ended up following up on this lead from Nikki, it isn't the last time that we hear about Shirley's potential involvement in all of this. Two years after the murder, detectives revealed that in December of 2007, approximately eight weeks before Lindsay was murdered, she had tried to contact the friend of her ex-boyfriend while she was on a visit to Calgary. Now what's interesting is just a couple of weeks later, on January 22nd, 2008, just a week before this murder took place, the largest drug bust in Alberta's history took place, and that same friend that she had previously tried to contact was arrested as being a major participant in this illegal drug operation. So it was speculated that Lindsay's murder may have been ordered by the drug cartel believing that she was possibly a police informant. Now, while detectives investigated this theory, they quickly ruled it out, saying that there was absolutely no way that she was an informant and that the personal nature of her murder did not fit a hired killer's method of operation. Now, this is a little bit contradictory because earlier they were saying that this person or these persons were meticulous, that this was planned, that it was well thought out, and that it probably was professional. But now they're saying that that doesn't quite fit. So which is it? A crime scene investigator and a veteran homicide detective also both agreed that Lindsay's murder was not a contracted murder related to the drug cartel, saying that yes, it was brutal, but it was too amateurish. Now, both seasoned investigators stated that they do believe that Lindsay's murder was very personal and planned by somebody very, very close to Lindsay, someone who had access to inside information from that Remax office that she worked. And as coincidences happen, that Remax office that Lindsay worked at was owned by Jason's mother, Shirley. So many people believe that Jason and his family were involved in Lindsay's death. And allegedly people are saying that his family is involved in the drug trade in Victoria and that they are all around kind of some, you know, business savvy but sketchy people. And it's suspected that Jason had picked up his colleague from that auto shop so that he had a witness to corroborate his alibi. And that when he moved his car to the main street, because remember initially he parked in front of the property and then 10 minutes later he decided to move it. So it's being suggested that he moved his car onto that main road outside of the property so that he wouldn't be in view of the murderers leaving the house, so that he wouldn't have any reason to give any sort of eyewitness statement. And it's also been said by some people that his 911 calls sounded very, very fake and completely unemotional. And what's more, that auto shop that he went to to pick up his friend and that he was selling and doing all of that, well, reportedly, it's a chop shop. Allegedly, it's a chop shop in addition to being a go-to place for criminals and what they describe as gangbangers. But the real mastermind believed to be behind Lindsay's murder is Jason's mother, Shirley. Now let's just talk about Shirley for a second. Shirley is a very powerful career woman. She ran that real estate company and she was very well versed in the MLS and listing software. And this has been suggested by people that when the couple or when that woman had called Lindsay with that very specific set of criteria of the home that they were looking for, it's believed that Shirley was leading Lindsay to choose a specific house, knowing that Lindsay would choose that one with all of those qualifiers that the couple wanted. And not only hitting all of the qualifiers, but also under that $1 million budget. Almost as though Shirley was planning and funneling Lindsay into that particular property on that particular day. And another interesting piece of information that ties back to Remax and possibly Shirley is one of the Remax employees. Rianne Garcia is the one who entered that property information into the MLS, and she entered that into the computer system on January 9th, 2008, just a couple of weeks before that first call was received by Lindsay from that mysterious woman. And on February 3rd, 2008, the day after Lindsay was murdered, 
Rianne quits Remax with no explanation. Shortly after the murder, Rianne went down to the police station and she said that Jason and his family were responsible for Lindsay's murder. And at first, she appeared to be very cooperative, but then when the police asked if she would take a polygraph test, she backed out. And for now the last 13 years, she has been uncooperative. It's also been said that at the time of Lindsay's murder, Rianne was allegedly in a relationship with one of the suspected conspirators in Lindsay's murder and was also obsessed with true crime shows such as forensic files, case files, all of these things. So could she have had a hand in this? Could she have played a role in this? As for motive and why Shirley would want Lindsay dead, it all goes back to the shady business dealings and the drug cartel and the drug trade in Victoria, allegedly. And many suspect that that family is involved in some very shady and shifty dealings and that Lindsay was made privy to them. It's also been rumored that Lindsay saw something that she shouldn't have seen. And her dad spoke out about that, actually, when he did a show with Dr. Phil, saying that she had confided in him a couple of times about something she saw that she wasn't supposed to but that she wasn't ready to open up to him yet and she wasn't ready to tell him what that was this has taken a toll on you mentally emotionally physically uh, you've lost your job you've lost really everything right house cars I mean you've given up everything in pursuit of this because this is your number one priority and nothing gets in the way of it correct that's correct, Dr. Phil. I pursue this daily, and uh, I always say when people ask me, you know, what does that mean to you? I say, all in. I'm all in. What do you think happened? Why do you think she was killed? And she saw something she shouldn't have seen. She was jeopardizing people's lifestyles. They executed her. You say she told you you don't know what it was? No, I don't, Dr. Phil. She said... I can't tell you right now, Daddy, but I will. And I know the reason she said that, because she was in the situation. And she knew that if she told me, I would tell her to remove herself immediately. And she wasn't ready for that. You've related this to the authorities. And they've investigated this and said they have, at this point, no reason to believe that, that any of that is true. They don't have any suspects regarding what you're saying? They don't believe anything is true, and they don't have any suspects. I don't know what they do. We did get a statement from them, and I'm gonna read it in part. I'm gonna put the whole thing up on drphil.com, but here in part is their statement. At no time has the investigation been declared a cold case, and an investigative team is presently assigned. We are aware of criticism from some family members the details of our investigation must remain confidential. While the police will always try to communicate and update families, the necessity of maintaining confidentiality to ensure a successful prosecution remains our priority. The Saanich Police remain committed to working in partnership with the RCMP. We will continue to work for justice for Lindsay. That's not a truthful statement. They declared it a cold case. They called me into their office on year two and said, Jeff, this is a cold case now. We've done our investigation. So I said, okay, turn over the file to me, which I'm entitled to, and information from the file. So they said, well, why don't you go have lunch and we'll call you after lunch. I did. They phoned me while I was at lunch and said, Jeff, we had a meeting. We've decided now it's active, so you don't have access to any of the case. So they will not keep it a cold case because they know I'll get information and so does the media entitled to information. So they just keep it cold case. The other thing not truthful there is the officers assigned are yes assigned to the case as their PR terms, uh -huh. but they work general detective work. That's not acceptable for me. Well, I understand and I, I understand your frustration here, but somebody did this heinous crime. And people that do this kind of thing, they talk, they tell somebody. Somebody has heard something about this somewhere and you may not recognize how consequential some little piece of the puzzle you might know, but when it's snapped together with another piece of the puzzle, it can make a difference. 
So look at this picture. And if you have heard someone talking about this, if you saw something, if you know something, you know, pick up the phone. I don't care if it's been 11 years or 12, 13, 14. This is a crime that deserves to be solved. This man deserves to have justice for his daughter. So if you know something, if you can help, please, please, please pick up the phone, give a tip to the authorities, and let's see if we can get this thing solved. That's what we're here for. That's what we want. Thank you. Okay? So could she have been made a witness to some of these shady dealings? Could she have known? Did they try to then shut her up? Is the mother the one who's really the puppet master here pulling all of the strings? In February of each year, Lindsay's father, Jeff, leads an annual walk to, of remembrance of Lindsay to raise awareness and keep her case in the headlines. He's also offered a reward of $500,000. In 2020, the FBI joined the case, and in February 2021, police say that the advancements in DNA analysis and other technology has now created new leads in the case. And they say, investigators are reviewing and retesting evidence, including items from the crime scene as well as digital evidence. Technology not available at the time of the crime has allowed us to develop new investigative leads. Many of you have likely seen in the media lately advancements in fields such as DNA analysis that has led to the resolution in many other cases. My name is Constable Marcus Anasasiades, and I'm the Public Information and Communications Officer with the Saanich Police Department. I am here today to update you on our efforts in the investigation into the murder of Lindsay Buziak. Our tight-knit community wants to understand what happened to Lindsay 13 years ago, as we are all connected to what happens in this area. To find those answers, we have established a task force comprised of new investigators who are taking a fresh look at the case. The task force has obtained the assistance from the FBI and continued support from the RCMP. Both agencies have provided valuable assistance in the development of new leads and forensic evidence. Lindsay was an ambitious 24-year-old described by her family and friends as popular, caring, and determined to become successful in her career as a licensed real estate agent. On February 2nd, 2008, shortly after 5.30 p.m., Lindsay was murdered in a vacant home located at 1702 D'Souza Place in Saanich. Lindsay had gone to the home for the purpose of showing it to potential buyers who are still unidentified. Lindsay met the unidentified individuals outside the home at approximately 5.30 p.m. Shortly thereafter, she was fatally stabbed in the upstairs bedroom of the home. Her boyfriend entered the vacant home shortly after her murder and called police. The new investigative team is examining all possible suspects. Investigators continue to follow up on every tip and lead we receive. Investigators are reviewing and retesting evidence, including items in the crime scene, as well as digital evidence. Technology not available at the time of the crime has allowed us to develop new investigative leads. As many of you have likely seen in the media lately, advancements in fields such as genealogy and DNA analysis has led to the resolution in many other cases. Investigators are out conducting interviews related to this case. We thank those people who have already been interviewed as we anticipate speaking with you again and appreciate your patience. For those who have not engaged with us previously, we know there is likely information that has not been shared. We believe people familiar with the circumstances surrounding this case remain in our community. It is sometimes the case that people who may have knowledge initially do not come forward due to their close relationships with those who may have been involved or out of concern for their reputation and standing in the community and among friends. We recognize relationships change over time, as do people and their perspectives. It is not too late to come forward. Further, there are times when people are knowingly brought into a situation by the person or persons responsible. Rest assured, we have the ability to filter out innocent people and those whose roles in the events were inadvertent. We ask that members of the community think back to Saturday, February 2nd, 2008. Please visit the Sandwich Police website or call our information line at 250-475-4356 or toll free at 1-888-980-1919 to provide any information you may have, no matter how small it may seem. 
Thank you for your time, and we look forward to our community's response and assistance. So what do you guys think? Do you think that this was a thrill kill executed by a random couple? Or was this strategically planned, a strategical planned hit or a murder? Do, who do you, if that's the case, and if it was strategically planned, who do you think was the mastermind? Was it the boyfriend, the mother, the cartel? I mean, it, again, it runs so deep and the, there are just so many theories that it's difficult to stay on a single path. But what we do know is that Lindsay's father, Jeff, is absolutely not giving up and he is not going to give up until he has answers and until people who are responsible for Lindsay's murder are held accountable. So what we can do for this is keep sharing this, keep pushing this story out there, keeping it in the public eye so that hopefully more answers begin to surface and ultimately justice is served for Lindsay. Let me know what you guys think in the comments below. And if you guys start doing some digging on this case yourself, let me know what you come up with. Because again, there are are just so many little caveats to this and like I don't even know I don't even know what I think guys I honestly I don't even know what I think I do think that the family seems very suspicious and I think there are far too many coincidences and you know what I all say where there's smoke there's typically fire so I I can't explain it away I, I do think that there may be some involvement there but as for the reason and the exact motive I'm unclear sure I need to do some more digging but let me know what you guys think in the comments below I'll keep you guys updated, and again, if you haven't subscribed yet, make sure you do so, and if you want to show support for the channel in a free way, all you have to do is give this video a thumbs up. All right, guys, thanks for tuning in with me today. I will be back with you again very, very soon with another case, and until that case, stay safe. Bye.